Hello, and thank you for watching. This is part two of the Renaissance Stage, an introduction to early modern English theater, and my name is, of course, Professor Ryan Paul. Thanks for watching. In part one of this lecture, I'm just going to be talking briefly about some of the intellectual origins of Renaissance drama. First, it's important to remember that Renaissance England was an oral culture, that is a speaking culture, and an aural culture, that is a hearing culture. There were very low levels of literacy, even once the new educational practices started spreading, and people were much more attuned to listening to speech than reading it. So they were much better at hearing, at following long, complicated speeches than we are. It was something they were much more comfortable with. And that's because they went to church, they went to various civic events, they went to public trials, and all these things were done verbally. In, with spoken language and presentation rather than through writing. So they had much better ears than we do, and they were much more attuned to speaking and listening. And of course, then, their education system reflects this reality. It was largely geared towards training people to participate in the public sphere through mastery of speech and language, learning how to speak, understanding language in a very deep way, being able to present oneself publicly, these were all important, essential parts of the education. And so the three core subjects of the classical education in this period, known as the trivium, or the three, uh, were grammar, rhetoric, and logic. So the way words are organized, the way one can speak in order to persuade, and the way to form arguments. So we can see their education is centered on language argument persuasion. Central to this educational philosophy was the practice of argumentum in utremque partum, which is Latin for to argue in both directions. So in order to ensure that students had a mastery of rhetoric and logic and grammar, they would be tasked with the ability to understand or argue both sides of a given controversy and have to make a case for one side as well as the other side. And these were usually, um, especially early on, silly controversies like what is better, night or day, things like that. But they could become more and more complex. And the idea here is, again, to enable people to be able to persuade by showing them how both sides of an argument would be presented and then enabling them to make their own best position within that controversy. So in practicing argumentum in utremque partum, the students would practice writing arguments on both sides of a given controversy. Again, what is better, day or night, things like that. And these were often written in the form of dialogues following the Platonic model. This is how Plato writes. He writes his philosophical tracts as dialogues. That way we can see the give and take of the two different sides, and we can see how each forms its argument in response to the other. So it's a very useful technique for learning how to argue and how to debate. And at the university level, people would often be writing plays and performing in plays. And this was an extension of that same philosophy. It's about exploring complex debates through the drama by actually acting out the different perspectives, embodying the different perspectives in characters, and then acting out their interactions through the action of the play. So drama was important as part of their education and professional training. And we can see why when we think about the most important vocations that education um, was setting people up for. Religious vocation, religious positions were still the primary reason for and the goal of education, especially higher education. If you went to university, it was generally to get a position within the church. And now why must a minister, why must someone in the church have to be able to argue from both sides? Well, in a time of religious controversy, a minister has to be able to understand both sides. So that way they can instruct their parishioners in what is, according to their church, true or right. So they have to be able to see what the other side says and then respond to that. And they also have to understand the seductive nature of sin, why it is that these wrong, wrongful doctrines or pleasures or desires are seductive and how they can draw people over in order for the minister, again, to be able to counter that with the truth on the quote unquote right side, the church's side. So ministers have to be able to see both sides in order to correctly uh, educate their parishioners.
Drama is also excellent professional training for the legal profession. Now, court cases in this period were tried very differently from today, so it's not like you'd have a, a prosecutor and a, and a defense attorney um, arguing before a judge. Uh, the accused had very limited rights, um, but lawyers needed to understand and interpret laws within a particular context, understand what law would apply in a particular situation or what wouldn't apply, or what about when there are contradictory or competing laws, depending on the situation, depending on the context and the particulars of a case. This is something that always happens in legal cases. So the ability to understand what is appropriate, what rules one should apply, how one should interpret and judge those rules, and the, and the ability to present and argue and persuade for why you think those laws have jurisdiction and another set of laws don't is essential to the legal profession. So it's again about debating, presenting one side, arguing in contest with another position, as well as of course being able to understand what the other perspective is saying in order to counter it. And of course education was also a gateway to political career, especially for people who were already wealthy uh, and nobles for their younger children to be educated and so thus have a, a more effective political career. And again, politics in England then and now is largely about debate, public oratory, lively debate. If you watch any current videos of Parliament, the English Parliament, you'll see them arguing and yelling and that's always been the case. So it's a culture of debate, of oratory. So the ability to present, to argue, to persuade effectively is key key also for a politician. Now let's consider some possible consequences of this educational intellectual heritage of Renaissance drama. As we've seen, there was a cultural and social premium on order. Because of so much change going on religiously, economically, etc., people were very afraid of disorder and so they put a big premium on, on order. Um, and their educational practices were intended to reinforce order by pursuing and finding truth. And that is God-given truth, the, the answer, the rule, the law of God that is written in the world of nature. But at the same time, in that pursuit of a singular truth, they do, throw, do so through debate, inquiry, investigation, argument, dispute. So they're pursuing a single truth but they do so by opening themselves up to the world of relativism and debate and contest. So there's a certain internal tension as there is in any cultural formation, as their social practices and their cultural values are at odds with one another. They look to reinforce order, but by doing so, they open the, the door to, in some sense, more disorder or change or upheaval. So it's an interesting paradox to consider and to see how that tension plays out in the drama of the period and the other works of the period, the other literature that we read. So building on that, a few questions before our first pause. How does our understanding this concept, knowing about argumentum in nutramque partum, that this was part of their educational philosophy and practice, how does that help us to understand how Renaissance drama works? What does it highlight or what does it help us to see in these plays about the structures and conflicts that define them? And where do we see those structures breaking down? That is, how does the search for truth through debate put the very idea of a singular truth into question? What's the contradiction there? And how do we see that occurring within the plays themselves as they start to try to uh, understand the answers to their conflicts, solve the problems that arise within the plays. And where do we see the plays confronting the possibility that truth is ultimately elusive or even non-existent? Where do they confront the idea that perhaps there are more than two sides to every debate, that there's not only two sides, that maybe there's even more perspectives? This is something we definitely see in Shakespeare, but I think we see it in Kidd, in Marlowe, and everyone. So look for how these plays both attempt to instantiate a sense of order and truth and an idea of an ultimate uh, reality or meaning, while at the same time revealing anxieties about the possibility of ever discovering that truth or tensions in the way that that truth is uncovered by finding dispute, difference, 
debate, argument. And now for a brief pause. On to part two, theater in London, the first stages. And yes, that pun was intended. Let's just briefly review from the previous lecture. Remember that we have the suppression of medieval dramatic forms, a growing city population with more disposable income as well as more education. And this sets the stage, again, pun intended, for a new popular art form, the Renaissance theater. So the first successful theater in London was called, funnily enough, the theater not very creative types, apparently. And it was built by two men, John Brain and James Burbage. And John Brain had previously uh, attempted to run a playhouse called The Red Lion back in 1567, but it had failed. So Brain and Burbage opened the theater in 17, uh, excuse me, 1576, and reports are, in terms of what scholars have been able to reconstruct, that it cost about 700 pounds to build, which was extremely expensive, extremely expensive. That's a lot of money to spend, especially for people who are not nobles or wealthy. Now, the theater um, was an early home to some of the professional acting companies, including L the Lester's Men, which James Burbage himself was a performer in, and uh, also the Admiral's Men, which had James's son, Richard Burbage, as one of its chief actors. And later, um, after the Lester's men and the Admiral's men either moved on or, or uh, were disbanded, the Lord Chamberlain's men took uh, the theater as their main stage. And the Lord Chamberlain's men had Richard Burbage as their chief actor and William Shakespeare as an actor and one of their lead playwrights. So their first home, uh, or one of their first homes, was the theater itself. So here is a 19th century reproduction of what we think the, um, the grounds around the theater look like. You can see it's roughly in the center, right by this large, long brick wall that goes up the left-hand side of the drawing. Um, and this is all on the property of a man named Gills or, or Giles Allen. Um, and you'll see his name up at the top. Uh, so all of this is his property, but as you can see, a number of other families had rented properties, were living on there, um, had their own gardens, had their own land that they worked, that they were renting from Giles. Um, so here you can see, again, just a sense of how it looked. Uh, and it's in a sort of rural area, obviously, given the large pond and the barns and cattle pen and so forth that's nearby. So this is a rural setting, not in the city itself. And so that leads us to a brief talk about the location of the uh, playhouse, which will come up, uh, be an important topic later in this lecture. It was built in an area called Shoreditch, which is somewhat north of the city of London proper. Um, and the reason why was because in 1572, the city of London banned all performance of plays within the city in order to prevent outbreaks of the plague. They were worried that when large groups of people gathered together, it was an opportunity for the plague to spread. And they went so far as in 1575 to expel all players from within the city walls. This was one of those laws that they couldn't really enforce, but the idea was to try to prevent any sort of drama, any plays from being performed within the city. So this was why they, they built the, the theater um, a ways outside of the city walls. And again, I'll come back to the subject later when we talk about um, the authorities of the city of London and their relationship to the theater. And we'll be coming back to this map as well, but this is a schematic layout of London. And if you see, the blue arrow is pointing to a dark black line, and that represents the old Roman wall built by the, the Romans um, centuries before that surrounds London. And within that wall, and bordered by the River Thames on the south, um, that is what's considered the city of London itself. So that if you follow that dark black wall, uh, that line all around, that's the city of London itself. And the green arrow up in the top right hand corner, that points us to where the theater is. So you can see it's a ways outside of the city, um, off in these fields that are not part of the city itself, but rather rural suburbs of the city. The theater had, uh, seems about a good 20 year run 
before in 1596, um, there was a dispute between Giles Allen, the landowner, and James Burbage's two sons, Richard and Cuthbert, who were his heirs uh, to his lease on the land. And it was a dispute over how much longer they could use the land for plays and so forth. Um, the Burbages were also in a legal dispute with John Brain's widow, their father's former partner, um, his widow, and his former business partner, Robert Miles. Uh, in fact, Richard Burbage is reported to have assaulted Robert Miles uh, at one point during um, their legal troubles. So the theater is closes down or essentially becomes vacant in 1596 when the Lord Chamberlain's men move to the nearby Curtain Theater because of their dispute. But that is not the end of the story. The Burbage brothers did not want to just give up the theater because they had put a lot of money into it. The materials itself were uh, part of their inheritance. So on the night of December 28, 1598, the Burbage brothers employed a carpenter named Peter Street. And Peter and his men dismantled the theater, apparently overnight. Um, and they took the materials and stored them off in Peter Street's workshop. And then the next spring, a few months later, they took all those materials, took them across London, shipped them across the river, and they built the Globe Theater, which of course is famous as Shakespeare's um, home theater, uh, most famous home theater. So the original theater, known as the theater, became repurposed as the Globe. Um, the Burbage, uh, uh, the owner, Giles Allen of the land, he attempted to sue Peter Street for trespassing, but as far as I know, there was never any legal, successful legal um, case brought against anyone for this um, rather cheeky and amusing little stunt. And now a brief break. And now part three of this lecture, Theater in London, Culture and Practice. So let's talk about the culture of London theater. The players, who were they? Well, we should first note that actors and various other entertainers, musicians, acrobats, all these sorts of things, there wasn't necessarily a lot of distinction between them. They weren't uh, always exclusive professions, although acting was becoming more and more professionalized at this time. But actors had very low social standing, as did most entertainers, um, and they were considered as vagrants, undesirables. It wasn't considered to be real employment. Um, and this is not so much because of any disdain for art, but because of the general disdain for artists as people who don't work hard, wake up late, all those sorts of stereotypes that we have about artists. Um, and so there were numerous laws throughout the period that criminalized vagrancy, unemployment, criminalized being a player. Uh, these were often very hard to enforce, but they were out there on the books, and they could often be used to at least uh, get someone in trouble or scare them off, if, even if the laws couldn't be enforced all that, that strictly. So acting troops, in order to make themselves official and in order to give themselves a, a good legal standing, they were sponsored by aristocratic patrons, and the troops were named after their patrons. So the Lord, the Lord Chamberlain's men, the Admiral's men, the Queen's men, the King's men. And of course, as you might imagine, the more important your patron, the higher status and higher profile your acting troop. Now, what about the patrons? What did they get out of it? Well, as an educated, elite, wealthy, noble person, giving uh, a little bit of money, patronizing an artist, was seen as a sign of erudition, of learning, of enlightenment. It was just something you did. It was a, a matter of course, um, an act of generosity, showing your how you value goodness and beauty and all those sorts of things. Also, of course, having some actors Poets, other entertainers on your payroll is nice if you're having a party or an event. They provided entertainment for their patrons, of course. Um, or in the early days, some actors were really servants who uh, engaged in multiple activities. They might do other work around uh, uh, their lord's home and then also serve part time as actors. Um, as actors became more professional, then this they would be distinguished from other servants, but they still worked for their patrons.
and they also provided a lot of good press for their patrons. They would write poems about how generous and noble Lord or Lady such and such was, um, and they would uh, talk about them uh, flatteringly in public at their plays and so forth. So it's good press for public figures. And as another sort of benefit, um, kind of a symbiotic benefit, Fashion was a big thing among the aristocrats, as it is today, of course. Um, fashion was always changing in each new season, and clothing was one of the most expensive things for acting troops. There's no costumes. There's no fake aristocratic costumes. If you wanted to dress like an aristocrat, you had to get aristocratic clothes. And those were extremely expensive, so patrons often gifted their old clothes to acting troops. Again, an act of generosity and a huge... Uh, savings to the acting troops, giving them this, this uh, valuable material as um, part of their property. Now the companies, how were they organized? Um, generally there were 10 or so shareholders, maybe sometimes a little bit fewer, sometimes a few more, and these were the people who essentially owned and ran the acting company. They managed it, they wrote and owned the scripts. So Shakespeare was a shareholder. Um, he would write scripts that he would then sell to his own company. They would pay him for it and the company itself would own the scripts. And these shareholders were also usually actors, performers, and they would take the key roles. They also employed a number of hired men. These were both the apprentice actors or people who would do minor roles, as well as their crew, the people who did things like helping with makeup and costumes, who handled uh, uh, props, who handled special effects, all the behind the scenes workers. So those were the hired men um, who worked for the central shareholders of the acting company. As you'll know if you've studied Shakespeare, the public theater was an exclusively male domain. That is, uh, the performances were all male, the companies were all male. So any female roles were, of course, played by young male actors. Or sometimes, if it's a comic role, like the, the old nurse in Romeo and Juliet, might have been played by an adult uh, or older male actor as part of the comedy. Um, and why is this? This is because in England, the public display and performance uh, or performance of a woman was considered immodest and scandalous. Women were not supposed to show themselves off on stage. This is different, however, in the courtly world. In court masks, women did perform. So it's a little bit different in the public theater. Um, however, this isn't to say that women were not a part of the theatrical world. Many of them did participate in various behind the scenes roles, um, working in, in various crew jobs, of course. Um, and there were many women who were entertainers, street entertainers and things like that, even if they weren't part of the professional companies. And another thing to note about the companies is that this was a tough, uh, as it is today, a tough business, not necessarily a lot of profit in it. So there's frequently uh, frequently struggles, disputes. Many of the companies would disband. Actors would move from one company to another if they had disputes or personality differences. So it was a chaotic sphere, um, people going back and forth from one company to a next to another. We'll talk briefly about costs associated with the companies. This is very hard to talk about, one, because of the data can be hard to reconstruct, but also because just comparing numbers doesn't really work, considering that, that so many things, uh, the costs of so many things are just radically different. So it's hard just to compare numbers from then to now. But costumes were generally the most expensive item, and the total value of apparel owned by any company could exceed hundreds of pounds, hundreds and hundreds of pounds. Again, costumes, especially aristocratic costumes, these are handmade. There is no machine manufacturing. They're all made with valuable, expensive, rare uh, uh, items, uh, many of them exotic cloths and so forth from overseas. So costumes, clothing, most expensive part. Uh, the plays themselves were not very expensive. They might pay a playwright six, seven, eight pounds per play, and then they owned it completely. The authors had no intellectual rights to their play once they'd sold it to the company. Then we have the hired workers. They weren't paid a lot, um, an average of one shilling a day per men, uh, one shilling per day for men, and that's about the average wage of a skilled worker in this period, um, and probably half that for boys, or maybe also for women if women were working, they might not have been, probably wouldn't have been paid as much as men. Um, and now, of course, the monetary system in Renaissance England, up until the 1970s in England was very confusing. Um, a shilling was 12 pence, and 20 shillings made a pound, so one pound was 
240 pence. Very confusing. Um, uh, but so you can see they didn't they didn't pay people a lot. Labor was cheap. It's the goods, the the material items that are really expensive. How much profits did they did they make? Well, it's really difficult to say. I don't know the data on that, but we do know that Shakespeare prospered as a shareholder of his company. That's how he made his money and uh, invested it very wisely. And so he did quite well as an actor and playwright. The stages themselves, uh, they were open air theaters uh, for the most part, which means they were exposed to the elements and so they were always performed in daylight. Keep that in mind when you read stories that are taking place at night. The audience would have been seeing them performed in full daylight. So the actors have to somehow create the idea that it's nighttime, that it's dark, etc. Um, the audience would stand in the yard, and they were called the groundlings, um, or they paid a little bit more, you could stand or sit in the gallery areas that were around the, uh, the main yard. And so it's uh, very cheap by our standards, although not necessarily all that cheap for them. One penny to stand in the yard, not a lot of money, but if you're a poor peasant, that's you know maybe a day's work. Um, another penny to sit in the gallery, and a third penny if you wanted to rent a stool. Those are at least prices around the 1570s, 1580s. No doubt things might have gone up a little bit, but that's generally the cost. So it's not expensive, um, especially if you're wealthy, but if you're a peasant, uh, it might be a little bit more. One penny was, was actually not, not uh, cheap if you're a peasant. And a special area of the galleries, they had special box seats that were reserved for the uh, most wealthy of wealthy aristocrats if they wanted to pay a little bit extra to have reserved seats that were excluded from the masses. So here's a, a cross-cut illustration of an Elizabethan theater. You see it that is round, right? That's very important. And the thrust stage that comes out, you can see the people acting on it. So the audience can surround three of the four sides of the stage. And the audience in the galleries that you can see cross-cut away, um, they look across and again surround three quarters of the stage. So um, it's a, actually a really uh, wonderful theatrical shape because it gives so much visibility to the majority of the audience. Almost everyone has a pretty good seat. Here's another uh, reconstruction of the globe itself um, with some attempts to give you a little bit of scale. So you can see by the figures about how big the space is and how um, tall the place is. As you can see, there's three levels of gallery seats. And as it might be clear, these seats um, were built at the time, they're pretty steep. They did not have the same um, safety regulations that we do about packing people into small spaces. So they were pretty, pretty steep seats, not necessarily very comfortable, and people were crammed in there. Um, and again, you can see it's all open air. The part of the stage is covered. Um, and you can see here some of the backstage areas where the clothing would have been, where the dressing rooms were. You can see up in the top um, above the stage, the area where the machinery, machinery would have been for, uh, if, for example, they need to lower or raise someone like a god or something like that, some supernatural ev event um, that they needed to dramatize. And here's just another illustration straight on. Again, you can see the thrust stage coming out and, and that uh, the audience, again, surrounds most of the stage. And you see the balcony about center uh, of the uh, right above the main acting area and the different doors in the center and sides for different exits and entrances. And here's an intriguing sketch. In 1596, a Dutchman named Johannes de Witt went to London, and while he was there, he visited the Swan Theater. He left some descriptions of it um, in his journal, and he also drew a sketch of it, which, as far as we know, is the only contemporary sketch of an Elizabethan playhouse. Now, uh, the original by de Witt was lost, but another um, one of his countrymen, a contemporary named Arendt van Buchel, reproduced it, copied it, and this is so the closest. It's not probably exactly what DeWitt wrote, but this is what Van Buchel said was um, the drawing that DeWitt left of the Swan Theater. So as far as we know, this is the only contemporary sketch of an Elizabethan playhouse that survives. Finally, just a couple photos of the contemporary Shakespeare's Globe, which was rebuilt in the 90s as part of a 
uh, tourist and artistic uh, venture, um, still operating, performing plays by Shakespeare and other Renaissance and contemporary playwrights. And so here's a view from the gallery uh, in, of a performance in 2006. So you can see the stage, you can see the audience, how they are right up on the stage. Um, they, so they get very close to the action, whereas in the galleries, you're a little bit farther away and sometimes even sort of around the corner. So you can only see part of the action. Um, that actually wasn't bad seating in the Renaissance. Those sort of seats uh, that are around the side of the stage were some of the most expensive because that's where the fancy pants aristocrats would go and wear their fancy new clothes. And so they would buy those seats, not so that they could see the audience or not so they could see the action, but so that the audience could see them in their fancy clothes. So here's one shot again of the Globe Theater. And here's another shot of the Globe Theater. Here you can see the uh, balcony a little bit better and some of the upper gallery area. So again, um, hopefully this gives you a sense of what it would have been like to actually be in the Globe and how the plays would have been physically performed. Now, the schedule for their performances, very rigorous. Um, they performed six days a week, every day but Sunday, in daylight again, and they had roughly a six-month season. They were closed again on Sundays um, and also on religious holidays, although they frequently violated that ban. There were times when they performed during Lent, even though they weren't supposed to, and other uh, popular feasts. It's just something that the law really couldn't enforce. Um, but they were also closed and not allowed to play at all, very strictly regulated, when there were any outbreaks of the plague. Again, fear that gathering a large people together, large number of people together, would be an opportunity to spread the disease. And this was something that they dare not violate um, for their own safety. So when the theaters would be closed during outbreaks of the plague, which was very frequent, that's when they would often um, uh, move to the countryside, tour around, go maybe to their uh, different aristocratic patrons, uh, country manors to earn money, go to the various towns, perform for the townspeople, and so forth. And not only were they playing a great deal, again, six days a week during a uh, six-month season, they were often, often performing a different play each day, um, five, six different plays a week that they would cycle through. Um, because there was a constant demand for new material, always putting in new plays. And so uh, perhaps in any one season, in any one six month season, the same troop of actors, 10 to 20 people, would perform as many as 20 different plays in a six month season, as opposed to now when an acting troupe might do four plays in a six or eight month season. So radically different performance um, uh, habits than, than we have today. Now, with such a broad repertory, um, how did they do this? Well, they were constantly cycling through their plays. Again, they'd add a new one every few days or weeks, uh, maybe remove an older play or a less popular play that hadn't been drawing so much. They might revive an old favorite if it's been a few months or years since it had been performed and they thought there was a draw for it. Um, so they're cycling through these plays, again, doing five or six different ones each week. Then maybe the next week do the same five, add a new one, the week after that, uh, remove one play, add in another new play. The week after that, revive an old play, add another new play. The week after that, cut a couple old plays, etc., etc. Because of this, that means they had little or no rehearsal time, maybe a day, maybe two days or less. So how did they pull this off? Well, uh, and they, they had no directors, so this was all entirely a sort of a communal process, um, a group process of bringing these plays together. How did they do it with no rehearsal time, with no director? Well, one, the actors relied on the fact that they just had exceptional memories. It was part of their educational training and part of their culture. They were able to remember much more than we could um, and much quicker. They also relied on their rhetorical training that they had had as education. They were trained to speak publicly and they relied on their improvisational skills, their ability to pick up and respond in the moment. So these plays were probably very lively, probably very quick, um, a little bit rougher than we might be used to or might expect, uh, but still very powerful um, and engaging in their performativity. And let's talk about the audiences. 
Um, the theaters could, on average, hold anywhere from 2,500 to 3,000 people if they were really packed in. That's not to say they always had 3,000 people in them, but that's about the max they could hold, we think. And in terms of attendance figures, again, really hard to pin down, but the theories run uh, roughly anywhere between 10,000 to 25,000 people in London were attending plays each week. Um, now, given that in 1600, the population of London was about 200,000, that means 5 to 10% of the city's population was going to the theater every week. That's pretty good numbers. Um, I think that our modern entertainment industry would be pleased if 10% of the population were going to plays or were going to movies every week. Um, so good numbers. We see it's, again, just extremely popular, probably the most popular form of public entertainment during the period. Another intriguing and important uh, point to know about the audiences was how diverse they were. Um, there was a mix of classes. Theater was popular with the poor, with the wealthy, with those who were well-educated, with those who were completely illiterate, with those who were um, born and raised in London, with those who were uh, from rural areas and had moved to the city to find their way. Um, interestingly enough, it was most popular at the extremes, among the poor and among the wealthy. The middle classes, those, those middling classes that we talked about that are starting to emerge, um, even though many of them provided the disposable income, there was also uh, within that class a large section of people who were suspicious of theater because of their religious heritage, because of their um, puritanical beliefs. Talk about that a little bit later in the, in the lecture. Um, also, mix of genders, both men and women attended the public theaters and European visitors were a little bit shocked that the English would allow women, both married women and single women, to attend the theater unaccompanied. So we have this strange um, situation where women weren't allowed to perform on stage in England. That was considered unacceptable, even though it was largely okay in the rest of Europe. But women were allowed to go to the theater unaccompanied. That was considered okay, even though there were people who didn't like it, um, but it was a common practice. Uh, well, that was that was scandalous throughout the rest of Europe. So sort of strange why that is. Perhaps we'll never be able to say, but it's an important detail to note. Now, coming back to something I talked about earlier, the location. Um, almost all of the playhouses, except for Blackfriars, were located outside of the city of London, like the theater was. And these were in areas that were generally called the Liberties. And they were called that because they were free from, they were not under the jurisdiction of the city's laws. Um, so they, there was more freedom for entertainment, revelry, especially things that the city of London found to be um, either morally or ethically unpleasant or potentially disruptive. So um, the liberties were also where people had their inns, pubs, brothels, uh, bear baiting and bull baiting arenas. This was a form of blood sport, which animals were set upon each other um, in, in violent uh, animal fights. Um, so all these sorts of things were happening in the liberties because the city did not um, govern there, did not uh, res regulate the areas. And so because of this, the public theater was associated by many with lascivious and dangerous forms of entertainment because it was nearby these places, it was associated with them. And of course, there certainly was um, a great deal of interplay between the theater and the more seedy elements of society, no doubt. So on this and the next slide, we'll, we'll look at the timeline and the location of the most important London playhouses. So we see the theater, the curtain, the rose, etc. Um, you can see them opening up starting all the way back 1576 up to Salisbury Court in 1629. And so on the next slide, um, we'll see a little animation again going back to that map of England and or excuse me, map of London and see where all these are located relative to the city of London itself. The theater 1576, the curtain 1577, the Rose, 1587. The Swan, 1595. The Globe, 1599. The Fortune, 1600. The Red Bull, 1605. White Friars, 1605. Black Friars, which the Kingsmen took over in 1608 and was an indoor theater within the city walls. The Hope, 1613. 
the cockpit, 1617. Finally, Salisbury Court, 1629. Just a brief note on Blackfriars, since it was since it is so different. Um, it was the site of a former Dominican monastery, and the friars there wore black robes, hence the name. Uh, in the 1580s, it was uh, used for performances by the various children's companies who had their own noble patronage. In 1596, James Burbage brought property on the site, um, apparently planning ahead that this is going to be a good indoor theater space. But as far as we know, it looks like it wasn't until 1608 that the King's Men, which was what the Lord Chamberlain's men became, so that included Shakespeare and the Burbage brothers, began to perform there. And because it was an indoor theater, that means they had to rely on candlelight. It was a more intimate, smaller space. Um, and they also were able to do more innovative staging and special effects there because of the, the indoor setting. Um, and the audience was pretty much exclusively aristocratic or more wealthy because it cost a whopping six pence or half a shilling for admission. So it was much more expensive than the other theaters. Now, a short 10 second break. And now for the last part of our lecture, anti-theatricalism, the anti-theatrical trends and the opposition to theater in London during the Renaissance. So we should step back for a moment just to get a little bit of historical context on the religious situation in England. Of course, as we know, this is a Protestant country. Elizabeth I, who inherits the throne, um, she inherits it after years and years of religious upheaval, and she does not want to go through that in her own reign. She herself was raised Protestant, but fairly moderate in her beliefs. Um, in fact, she, she uh, had a lot of sympathy for many Catholic doctrines and pra practices. So as her religious and political strategy, she adopted what people consider a sort of third way. She adopted many central, central Protestant doctrines, enforced outward conformity, so going to church and so forth, but she left many pre-Reformation practices and institutions intact. So the Church of England, the official Church of England, in terms of its structure and at least the way in which services were uh, performed, is often much closer to Catholic Church than some of the more radical Protestant groups. Among those groups were the people that we call Puritans. And Puritanism was a more radical form of Protestantism, and Puritans were in general very dissatisfied with what they felt to be very moderate or ineffective reforms of the church. Um, Puritan, incidentally, was originally a derogatory name, an insult for these people, um, uh, meant to sort of highlight their strict, um, stringent nature, and it's frequently used as an insult, for example, in Shakespeare. Um, Puritanism is defined, or one of its defining traits at least, is an extreme mistrust of all worldly pleasure and beauty. So a fear always looking out for things that are temptations to sinfulness. And entertainment, popular entertainment, was a very big temptation. Puritans also insisted on a very strict social order um, in order to maintain God's order. You should know your place and you should labor in it humbly to serve God. So these are some key issues with Puritanism that eventually would put it into conflict with the theater. So, as I mentioned before, um, among the middling classes, this was where Puritanism and other more radical Protestantisms were largely taking hold um, in the newly educated and the newly wealthy. Um, and City of London authorities, who were largely from this class um, and were thus influenced by the trend and the beliefs of Puritanism, um, enacted many restrictions against the theater. And some of these, as we saw, were about health, um, but a lot of them were about morals and ethics and about the ideas that they feared that the uh, theater was promoting. One of the chief complaints of the anti-theatrical uh, uh, party was that it subverted political order. We have common actors, commoners, everyday people pretending to be kings, pretending to be nobles when they are not noble. 
and this was seen to violate um, God's given order of who is uh, a highborn and who is lowborn. Um, at the same time, the nobility, the characters, the noble characters were portrayed often in common, embarrassing manners, associated with common people, doing ridiculous or even sinful things. And then finally, frequently there's a representation of political violence and disorder in these plays, especially the history plays. Ironically enough, when presenting English history, that was when one would perhaps uh, be in danger of showing the most uh, potentially subversive acts because English history was full of civil war, violence, usurpation, and that sort of thing. So this was something that, that uh, people found uncomfortable about the theater. Another huge issue was the issue of the cross-dressed male actor, because these are often attractive young men dressed as women. And so there was all sorts of anxiety about what the seductive power of the attractive cross-dressed males would do. There was the fear that it would cause male audience members to lust after beautiful boys and unnatural desire, or just excite, excite their lust for women. Um, it was also feared that it could arouse unnatural lusts in women for other women. Um, as well as just exciting women's general lust for men. And of course, there were threats to the boy actor themselves who might be um, aroused to desire both men or women. Um, and dressing as a woman, behaving as a woman was seen as a threat to effeminate that boy actor's body and soul. So just the men dressing as women was hugely controversial amongst um, uh, a certain group because again of the way it violated what was seen as God's given sexual order and the proper relation of the genders and the proper bodies and clothes for those genders by having a man dress as a woman and engaging in erotic play on stage with another man. And of course, there's fears of social disorder. Um, again, as we've said, anytime a group of people are together, there's always the fear of opportunities for organizing or riot, especially in plays that dealt with controversial content, um, as many did. Uh, there's the fear of the spread of the plague when large people get together. Um, the fear that even though women did regularly go to the plays unattended, go to the theater unattended, many people were afraid that those unattended women would be seduced into immoral acts, either by watching the plays and having their lusts excited, or just by the uh, undesirable people that they would be around. And so the presence of various degenerates and criminals, thieves, prostitutes, etc., at playhouses or near them was also something that was considered um, a real big problem and another one of the reasons why many people opposed the theater. Finally, there were also artistic complaints uh, about the theater, although these were usually confined to um, writings and intellectual debate rather than actual policy. Um, many people did level criticism at the theater, though, for its artistic crimes. Chief among these was our good friend Sir Philip Sidney, who in his tract, The Defense of Posey, wrote a great deal about all the problems with English theater. Um, and these basically boil down to things like violating the classical unities. They don't all take place at the same location in a set period of time. Rather, they range over different locations and they might take uh, cover a course of days or weeks or months or even years. Um, a violation of decorum, that is you have high and low characters mixing together and high characters involved in low plot lines, low characters involved in high plot lines. Now, even though that's an artistic complaint, it's also a complaint about politics, right? Not wanting to see noble characters portrayed in a low manner or associating with other low characters. Um, this extended to the violation of genre, a mix of high and low styles and mix of different genres, um, and a violation of the poetic purpose. Um, Sidney and many believe that the purpose of poetry was to instruct, to teach, and delight. But Sidney, even though he didn't really complain too much about the morality of the English theater, said, this does not hold up good morals. This does not present us with noble men that we should be admiring. It's um, base and common entertainment. It's not instructing us. So those are some of the artistic complaints, although they do obviously um, overlap with the political and moral complaints about the theater.
So we'll have a short break and then just a few last questions. So there are some lingering questions I imagine you might have, and I'm going to try to answer them as best as I can. One is, why were the nobility more tolerant of the theater than the middle classes? Um, it's hard to say, but one answer is certainly the Tudors. Henry VII, Henry VIII, they loved entertainment, they loved plays, they loved pageantry, and this became a popular thing because of them. Just how anytime someone with a lot of power and influence likes something, other people start to like it. So plays, actors, acting became popular amongst the rest of the nobility as well. And this extended into the reign of the Stuarts. James I was also extremely popular, or excuse me, was also extremely fond of plays. So um, this, it just seems to have been something that because of the personal likes of, a, of a, some powerful people, the drama became uh, a popular art form. Another question is, well, what about all the problems of disorder? Wouldn't the nobility and the, especially the queen and the king be just as worried about these issues of disorder as the Puritans in London were? Um, yes, they were. And they did enact many strict policies to control the theater. Um, notably when uh, uh, the Earl of Leicester sponsored a production of Richard II, Shakespeare's Richard II, shortly before he attempted to overthrow Queen Elizabeth. Um, the Queen was very upset about this because it, Richard II, dramatizes the overthrow of a king, of the rightful King of England. Um, so there were great anxieties and there, was, there were concerns about the potential for disorder and disruption portrayed by the theater. But apparently, just for whatever reason, the nobles did not seem to be as worried about it as the um, sort of middle class authorities. Perhaps this is because they just felt more confident in their, in their rank. They had been the nobles, their families went back generations, as opposed to the newly wealthy and the new authorities who were new to the position of power. And ironically, it seems that again, the middle classes were more concerned about how the nobility would be portrayed than the nobility themselves. Um, perhaps that speaks to something of the aspirational desires of that, those middle classes. They wanted to be the nobles, so they were much more upset um, about potential or what they perceived as threats or slights to authority. That would be my hypothesis. And a final lingering question, why were the poorer classes more tolerant of the theater? Well, I think there's a few answers here and, and probably a little bit easier to explain because easier to understand. One answer, they were just closer to the older dramatic traditions, those traditions of the medieval morality and city site plays and city cycles and the festivals that had been suppressed. Those were all primarily um, entertainments for the, the lower classes, the working classes. So they had a closer tie to these traditions and more interest in bringing something like them back. And they also, as the poorer classes generally do, had a greater need for entertainment and escape. They needed something to make their lives more tolerable. So I think that's probably, uh, those are probably some of the issues why the poorer classes were more tolerant. Um, and also the issues that, that brought the uh, drama to the um, negative attention of authorities, some of the moral or politically subversive elements of it, would have just been more entertaining and I think amusing to the poorer classes who are not so vested in maintaining the power struggle, the power system as it is. So I think that's, those are some of the reasons why the poor um, and working classes were more, were more tolerant of theater. So finally, just a brief review, just hit the main points because I went over a lot today, but just to note, the educational practices of Renaissance England fostered a culture of debate dialogue and dramatic contest in England. And that was really one of the key roots that made this art form flourish because it was just in the language, in the DNA, in the thought processes of the English to debate and to contest and to argue one person versus another and to take up different roles in that argument and try to portray it or understand it from one point of view versus another.
Um, the public theaters exploded in popularity in the late 1600, late 16th century, early 17th century, particularly in the 1590s and 1600s. As you saw, that's when most of the theaters seem to have been uh, springing up. And of course, despite its popularity, the theater was extremely controversial because of the way it seemed to challenge uh, religious, political, and social order. So those are some of the main things that we talked about today. If you have questions, of course, you know how to get in touch with me, Blackboard, email, text. Otherwise, fare thee well on your journeys this week and good luck.